On December 7, 1941, an armada of Japanese planes took off from aircraft carriers deep in the Pacific Ocean. A few hours later, they were wreaking havoc and destruction on the American Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. American blood was shed on American soil by a foe many Americans thought to be inferior. A day later, Congress declared war on Japan and brought the United States of America into the most destructive war of the 20th century. Some of the people who were angriest with the attacks were Japanese Americans themselves. Gray, dove gray, with red dots on the wings. I knew they were Japanese. And I felt that my, the world that I had known and had dreamt about and planned for had come to a shattering end. Despite this anger, however, their loyalty was called into question, and the government they had respected reacted rashly and decided to imprison its own citizens within their country. The attack on Pearl Harbor led to a period of hysteria and irrational reactions in our nation's government, where the Constitution was ignored and thousands of loyal Americans were wrongly imprisoned. Many white people, governmental and civilian, thought that if Japan's attack against the U.S. had been successful, there must have been sabotage involved. After Pearl Harbor, the JACL, or Japanese American Citizens League, sent a telegram to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, telling him that they pledged their full cooperation. However, FBI inspectors still came around to Japanese American neighborhoods and searched houses for anything Japanese. Many EC, or first generation Japanese, burned everything they had from Japan. Mary Matsuada Gruenwald, a Nisi, or second generation Japanese American, describes the scene of her family destroying anything Japanese. That fateful day, we burned all of our cultural treasures in the oil burning stove in the living room. We tried to make our house and yard appear untouched, careful not to disturb the cobwebs in the corners of each room or the dust on the picture frames. We didn't want to look as if we disturbed anything. The only Japanese book we didn't burn was the Bible. In a few days, many racial slurs and caricatures appeared in newspapers and editorial cartoons. One entitled How to Spot a Jap by Milton Caniff, a popular children's cartoonist, made many racist remarks and showed a typical Japanese man as a short, frowning, shuffling, lisping subhuman. Prejudice increased. People who had knowledge of the coastline, made frequent trips to Japan, or had been part of Japanese society were arrested without a trial. Even Buddhist priests were not above suspicion. Prejudice against Japanese Americans grew and grew until Roosevelt was forced to take action. On February 19, 1942, a Nisi speaker said, Our greatest friend is a man who is the greatest living man today, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That same day, the president he loved was signing a document that would send him and thousands of other loyal Americans to camps far away from their homes. The document was Executive Order 9066, which forced Japanese Americans to move into relocation centers. The order was worded neutrally. It never mentioned Japanese or any other ethnic group. It never used the words relocation, detention, resettlement, evacuation, or internment. In one stroke of his pen, Roosevelt took away the power of Francis Biddle, the Attorney General, to deal with civilians in wartime, and gave it to the Secretary of War. He felt he had the power to issue this order as Commander-in-Chief, much as Lincoln had done with the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Overnight, signs appeared on street corners with the ominous heading, To All People of Japanese Ancestry. Executive Order 9066 gave the WRA a War Relocation Authority and the Army the power to prescribe war zones within the United States and move all suspicious people to them. This order was entirely against the Constitution and suspended almost all the rights Nisi had been living under their entire lives. The commander of the Army's West Coast Defense was Lieutenant General John DeWitt. While he was not the only one with prejudice against Japanese, he was the one in the best position to act on it. Disliked by his superiors, and ridiculed by the FBI, his main claim to fame before the war was being a general in the Quartermaster Corps. DeWitt claimed that there was no way to tell if Japanese Americans were loyal or dangerous. His West Coast defense issued this statement about Japanese Americans being singled out. Because of the ties of race, the intense feelings of filipiety, and the strong bonds of common tradition, culture, and customs, this population presented a tightly knit racial group. It was impossible to establish the identity of the loyal and disloyal with any degree of safety. DeWitt created 12 restricted zones that Japanese, German, or Italian Americans were not allowed to stay in or enter. Initially, these zones were mainly in Washington and Oregon. 
but eventually they, they stretched to cover all of California. The WRA encouraged alien families to move out of these areas to places farther inland. About 5,000 left. On March 27, 1942, the window of opportunity closed and all Japanese Americans who remained in the areas were sentenced to imprisonment. Meanwhile, in Hawaii, Lieutenant General Delos Edmonds listened to reports, maintained his composure, and took the smarter approach of not interning Japanese Americans. Unlike DeWitt, he reacted wisely and stood up under political pressure. Even if he hadn't, relocation in Hawaii didn't make any sense. Japanese Americans made up 37% of the population. Back on the West Coast, DeWitt was creating restricted areas and limiting the rights of Japanese Americans. With what FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover called hysteria and lack of judgment, DeWitt made all Nisi citizens non-aliens and officially authorized the relocation and internment of all Japanese Americans on the West Coast. Attorney General Francis Biddle wrote, The decisions were not made on the logic of events or on the weight of evidence, but on the racial prejudice that seemed to be influencing everyone. Japanese American homes and businesses that had just been recovering from the Great Depression were forced to sell to white buyers who snapped up deals for a few dollars. Homes, personal property, and pets were all left behind in the rush to pack belongings into the allotted two suitcases. Yoshiko Uchida remembered, We sold things we should have kept, and packed away foolish trifles that we should have discarded. After the war, the U.S. government estimated that the Japanese Americans left behind $200 million worth of property. The date of the evacuation was March 23, 1942. Entire neighborhoods moved silently to the staging areas. There, they boarded trains with the shutters down and armed guards patrolling the corridors. These trains would take tens of thousands of loyal Americans to 16 abandoned racetracks and fairgrounds that would serve as assembly centers while the permanent camps were being built. From these centers, they moved to the internment camps. By December 7, 1942, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, every person who had ancestors that came from Japan on the west coast were imprisoned in a WRA camp. Over 110,000 innocent people were ripped from their homes and moved to large swaths of barren land with barbed wire, armed guards, and row upon row of neat uniform barracks. One Nisi asked, why do all the guns point inward? There were enormous crowds and confusion at mealtime and at any other public gathering. Three times, Nisi brought the case of internment to the Supreme Court in the cases Yasiu v. the United States, Hirabayashi v. the United States, and Korematsu v. the United States. All three times, the court ruled in favor of internment. To combat the stress and depression from having nothing to do, Many Japanese Americans tried to make the best of their situation and took on the jobs they'd had in civilian lives. However, many people wandered around aimlessly with their hands in their pockets and eyes downcast. The weather at most of the camps was awful. Dust settled on everything in the camps located in the deserts, and in the northern camps, the temperature could drop below zero and snowstorms assailed the flimsy wooden barracks. Some Japanese Americans were able to apply for jobs outside of camp or finishing their college education. Some Nisi enlisted in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Authorized by Roosevelt on February 1st, 1943, it was an all-Japanese American regiment that would later join up with the 100th Infantry Battalion, a unit made up of Hawaiian Japanese that were in the army when the war started. There were mixed feelings about volunteering. Some Japanese Americans felt that America had treated them horribly and did not deserve their support. Others wanted to prove to America that they were loyal citizens who would defend their country as readily as any white man. By the later years of the war, much of the hysteria of 1941 and 42 had died down. By June 1944, the Germans were being beaten back in Europe, and the possibilities of a Japanese attack on the West Coast were virtually non-existent. Roosevelt was recorded saying that some Japanese American families might be able to return home. This became a reality in late 1944, when the Supreme Court case Endo v. the United States overturned the previous decisions and the WRA became determined to close the camps even if they had to force the internees out. Some internees would return home to find that friendly white neighbors had kept their houses intact, while others returned to shattered windows and graffiti-covered walls. The government realized it had reacted rashly and has reformed its policy and allowed first-generation Japanese Americans to become citizens. Several times the government has sent out formal letters of apology and has honored and reimbursed the veterans of the camps.